So last week we mentioned in detail the importance of establishing a home. And in particular, I mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, established in the Qur'an that the home is a place of peace, and that should be the definition of a home. And that that peace actually provides us with several benefits. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told us that it protects us from fitna. Um, we also know that it preserves our deen. It's a place of repose. So the actual home that we create is one of the safe havens which allow us to protect our deen. Now, we also mentioned the important aspect of the home, which is that we actually control the home. So we make a lot of very grand statements about how we think we're going to change the world or how we think we're going to change the city or how we think we're going to change the community. But in reality, we have no control over much of what occurs. So we can't go out and change the environment. In fact, in the environment has begun to infiltrate into our homes and into our masajid. And so the one place in the world where we do have control, where we can actually establish an Islamic environment is in the home. We have a right to do it by law. No one would have, no one can say anything if you do it. In fact, it's totally up to you what you want to do within, within your four walls. So it's very, very important that we understand some of the etiquettes of the homes and the ruling of the home because it provides for us a tremendous, important, tremendous pillar for us in establishing our deen. So that's what we talked about last week and we talked about it in detail. So anyway, when you think about a home, the very first step that actually occurs in preparing the home is that we choose a spouse. So a sister, when she chooses to marry someone, she's actually choosing who is going to be her partner in establishing the home. And when a brother, when they choose to marry someone, what they're really choosing is who is going to be a partner in establishing their home. So the partner that you choose is the very, very first step in establishing a home the way you would like to establish it. Now, last week or maybe two weeks ago, a brother called me up and he said, I'm getting married in a couple weeks, can you give me some advice? So I told him, I said, you asked me the question at the wrong time. Because actually the whole issue of getting married was you should have asked before you chose the person. Can you advise me on how to choose a person? That's the key thing. First point is who you choose. Once you've chosen someone and you decided to get married, now the advice is limited. So the Prophet Wasallam did not only advise people when they were getting married and after they were married, but he advised on how to choose a partner. And so it's very important that we recognize that where the Prophet Wasallam gave pieces of advice on how to choose a partner, that we actually take those to heart. Because here the Prophet Wasallam is establishing how you choose your partner in establishing yourself in the hereafter. Now if you think about it, in this world, nothing that you see in this world around you will you take with you into the hereafter. Even this masjid will not be in the hereafter. The clothes we wear will not be in the hereafter. The cars we drive will not be in the hereafter. But actually, your spouses will be with you in the hereafter. It's one of the few things in this world that actually is permanent. If you have a positive relationship with one another, then that's one of the few things in the world that actually is permanent. And so it's very important that one, you choose the right partner so that that be permanent, number one. And number two, because when you actually are choosing a spouse, what you're doing is you're choosing who is going to be a partner with you in pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that he admits you into his garden. Now there's a certain amount that you can do on your own. And then when you have a proper spouse, there's so much more that you can do. If you have a strong spouse, when you're down, the spouse picks you up. When, you're, when the spouse is down, you pick them up. So the spouse is very, very important. And you'll see that the Prophet ﷺ gave many pieces of, pieces of advice concerning the spouse. Anyway, the first piece of advice that the Prophet ﷺ gave, and all of it is centered around this concept which I mentioned in this ayah in the very beginning. Al-Balad al-Tayyibu The... Um, the wholesome land, yakhruju nabatuhu, uh, its fruits exit from it bi'idni rabbi, with the permission of its Lord, meaning the Lord of that land. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues later in that ayah by saying, waladi khabutha, and as for that which is bad, right, which has despicable, something despicable within it, la yakhruju illa nakada, it, nothing exits from it except that which is scant. So in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving the general principle that when you talk about a piece of land, 
if a piece of land is good, good things exit from it. And if a piece of land is bad, very little will exit from it. Same thing, but in the same concept here applies in the marriage. If the people involved in the marriage are good, then good will exit from it. And if the people in the, involved in the marriage are not good, then very little will exit from it. Meaning the key things that should be exiting from the marriage. Peace, tranquility, establishment of a home, establishment of the deen, etc. So the first device that the Prophet them gave is that when you're choosing a spouse, you should choose for four things. Meaning that when you look at a person, now actually it's a very beautiful piece of advice. Because when you look at a person, there are so many complexities involved in a human being. Right? So when you think about a person, they have their characteristics, they have their emotions, they have their job, they have what they earn, they have who their parents were. There are so many characteristics by which you can describe a human being. And here the Prophet ﷺ actually boxed it into four categories and said that what you should do when you look at the complex person that you're deciding to marry is that you should look at these four characteristics. Number one, you should look at the wealth of the person. So the Prophet is establishing that this is something important, it's something you should think about and reflect on. Number two, you should look at the beauty of the person. Number three, you should look at the lineage of the person. Which family are they from? So that also is important. And then number four, you should look at the religion of the person. Now the Prophet in particular in this hadith was actually addressing the Sahaba. And so he said you should look for these four things in a wife. But in general, these apply for both sides. Okay. And then the fourth thing is that you should look at the religion of the person. Then the Prophet them advised, after making that general statement, that if you want to simplify the formula even further, then the real thing that you should be looking at is the religion of a person. Because in the end, that's the true wealth. In the end, that's the true lineage. right? And in the end, that is the true beauty. Now, if, you, if a person is righteous, their lineage takes them back to the Sahaba in the sense of that group of people who they'll be raised with on the Day of Judgment, right? There's your family in this earth, and then there's your family on the Day of Judgment who you're going to stand with. And the father of that family will be the Prophet Sallallahu them. And then the members of that family will be all of the believers. So true, lineage does have some bearing in this world. And it is important that you look at lineage, but actually, if you can look at Deen, then Deen has its own lineage as well. Similarly, wealth is important. If you have wealth in this life, then you can have some things that you perhaps other people may not be able to have. But in the end, the true wealth lies in deen. Why? Because with that wealth, you attain permanent blessing. Now, with the wealth of this world, we attain certain blessings. We might have a nice car. We might have a nice house. It's never even guaranteed, and it can slip from your fingers in a moment. But with the wealth of the deen, that's the true wealth because it establishes for, for, establishes for the individual permanent bounties. Okay, and then the Prophet ﷺ said, look at the beauty of a person. Now it's true. Externally, everybody has a particular beauty that their body has. But the truth of the matter is that we are also composed of a soul. And the body, while it's not permanent, the soul is permanent. And on the day of judgment, the beauty of the body will be based on the beauty of the soul. The person with a beautiful soul will be raised beautifully. And on the Day of Judgment, they'll be put in Jannah in a beautiful form. Their body will be different, but it will be beautiful because their soul was beautiful. Similarly, on the Day of Judgment, the most beautiful external person in this world, if their soul was corrupt, they'll be raised in the hellfire. And if they're raised in the hellfire, their skin will be burning, their, their body parts will be pierced. You've read all the hadith about the punishments that occur there. So while beauty is something by which we judge in this world, actually, the beauty of the deen is the most beautiful deen because it uh, is the most beautiful aspect of a person because that results in permanent beauty on the hereafter, number one. And in this world, there's a special nur that exists in people of, of righteousness that ends up attracting another person's soul. Now understand, when a person gets married, the person contains two components, right? The, uh, the, the husband has a body and a soul, and the wife has a body and a soul. Now, when they first look at each other and they first interact with one another, it's the bodies that interact. Physically, they see one another, they interact with one another. And they can be the two most beautiful people. But in the end, the souls begin to interact. A week passes, two weeks passes, six months pass, a year pass. Eventually, there comes a time when the souls begin to interact. And if those souls are ugly, then they have a very negative interaction between one another. And that's what you see constantly. You see these celebrities get married. 
they are quote unquote the models of beauty within the society. Right? These are the models of beauty within the society. And then when they get married within a very short period of time you see that they're breaking up, they're getting divorces. Why? Because while their bodies were there, the wealth was there, when the souls began to interact, that's when the irreconcilable differences begin. Irreconcilable because my soul wants to please itself completely and her soul wants to please itself completely. Now these two souls, they can't live with one another. Yeah, our bodies are, are reconcilable, but our souls are irreconcilable. We can't reconcile the difference that exists between them. So actually, in the end, it's the soul that matters. And so what the Prophet ﷺ is highlighting here is that there are some external things that you can look at. There are some aspects of the body that are important. But in the end, the key thing is to focus on the soul. Okay, so that's one hadith. In another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that a righteous wife um, who can help you with your worldly and religious affairs is the best treasure that anyone can have. Is the best treasure that anyone can have. Now, what the Prophet ﷺ is highlighting is that in our quest of life, we aim to attain certain wealth. Everybody has, that's just human nature, right? We want to have a car. And in the back of our minds, many people say, I want to have this particular car. We want to have a house. And in the back of our minds, we have an idea. I want to live in this neighborhood. I want to have this kind of house. It should look a certain way, right? And so there are certain treasures that we aim to obtain in this life. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is highlighting that true, those might be treasures. But the truest treasure the greatest treasure in this life is actually a righteous wife. Why? Because she provides you benefit in both places. A nice car benefits you in this world. A nice house benefits you in this world. But a righteous wife benefits you where? In this world and in the hereafter. So that's another hadith. And these are all sahih hadith, by the way. Okay, in another hadith, the Prophet wasallam said, Let every one of you have three things. He gave a general command to his companions. Let each one of you have three things. And then he listed three things. The third thing is that he advised us to strive for a believing wife. What type of believing wife? Who will help you get and strive for the hereafter. So he qualified it. There are many believing women out there. And there are many believing men out there. But he qualified it and said that believing wife, or in general, taken from this hadith, that believing husband, who will be someone who will cause you to strive for the hereafter. That person who will remind you when you're low that it's time to get ourselves back on the path of striving for the hereafter. So again, the Prophet ﷺ is highlighting the benefit and the importance of picking a proper spouse. These hadith explain how the Prophet ﷺ advised us to pick a good spouse. But in another hadith, which is also Sahih, the Prophet ﷺ advised us against picking a bad spouse. In particular, he's speaking to the companions, and he talks about picking a wife. And so here the Prophet ﷺ says, One of the elements of happiness is a righteous wife. One of the elements of happiness is a righteous wife. When you see her, you're pleased, and when you're away from her, you can trust, you can trust her with what you've left behind. And then he continued the hadith. And he says, And one of the elements of misery, one of the elements that makes a person miserable is a bad wife. When you see her, you feel upset, and she keeps attacking you verbally with her tongue. And when you're away from her, you can't trust her with what you left behind. So again, here the Prophet ﷺ is not only advising the one aspect, which is to choose a proper wife, but then here he takes the opposite aspect and advises us to not choose a wife that could cause misery. Again, this hadith is directly addressed to the Sahaba and so it applies literally to the males when they're choosing a wife, but it also applies to the females when they're reflecting upon which husband they should choose. So all of this is highlighting for us that the Prophet wasallam is advising for that individual who aims to take their soul to the next gener to the next destination, right? We have a journey of the body and we have a journey of the soul. The journey of the body starts as a baby, it peaks as a, as a youth, and then it becomes nothing when you become old. It peaks and then it drops down in this life until it eventually becomes dust. 
But then there's the journey of the soul which begins to peak in this world, begins to experience Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at a level in this world and then eventually gets into Jannah and has an even greater experience. So that's the journey of the soul. It peaks. And here the Prophet is highlighting that to attain the pinnacle in this world of that journey, the important aspect is that you pick the proper spouse. So it's very, very important for those people who are making this choice that they pick the, pick the proper spouse. Now, there are two other key things in this regard. And that is, is that everybody may not be in that state. Some people are in the state where they're not ready to get married. So they're not even picking a spouse. And then other people are in the state where they're already married. So they already have to now deal with the situation in which they're in. So for those people, there's a different ruling. For the people who are not yet married, there are two key things. Number one, that they look with sincerity. Now, all of these words, they might sound important and you might internalize them and shake your head when I say them. But then when it comes to your individual search, you begin to overlook these things and give balance to the wrong things. Like you know there's someone who's very righteous and you know someone who's much less righteous, but then the beauty attracts you and you go for the person who's less, less righteous and then you try to convince yourself in your own mind why, that, why this was a better choice, right? So while you might hear these words and really reflect on them and agree with them, it's very different to apply them with sincerity. So the first thing to remember is that you need to apply these things with sincerity. That's the first point. The second point is that you have to strive yourself. You cannot expect that you are going to get a righteous wife if you yourself are someone who is not righteous. That's the primary principle. That's actually the key principle in the whole matter. Now, the Sahaba were sincere, and their words were sincere, and their testimony was sincere. So who did they get? They got the Prophet ﷺ as their companion. Understand that that dynamic interaction that occurred between the Sahaba and the Prophet ﷺ, it was not the Prophet ﷺ being descended upon a group of people, but it was also the fact that the companions were a chosen group of people. They were chosen to receive the Prophet ﷺ because there were characteristics within them that allowed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them with this. And in fact, in hadith it comes where the Sahaba mention their characteristics and they say, this is why we, were thi- we, why we think we were blessed with the ni'mah of the Prophet ﷺ and with the ni'mah of Islam. And this applies in everything. It applies in everything. Now people, they come to me and they say, I'm, I'm gonna, I want to go study abroad, I'm very worried about which teacher I'm going to get. Or I think I want to study the deen, but I don't think there's a good enough teacher for me. That's the biggest deception. That is the number one deception. Actually, the point is that you should prepare yourself as much as possible. And it is guaranteed, tried, true, and test, tested that if you prepare yourself and you are sincere, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send you a teacher from the extreme corner of the world. No doubt. There is no doubt in this principle tested. If you are sincere in a righteous thing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send you righteous company or some means by which you can attain that sincerity. Now there are a group of people who in the back of their mind they have a deep desire to donate. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides them with wealth because He loves to see them donate. And there's another group of people in the back of their mind they say they think they want to donate but in reality they have no interest in donating. They simply want to amass the goods of this world. Very rarely does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provide them. And if He does, it's a deception in order to give them the benefits in this world so that they don't gain in the hereafter. So it's very important that number one, we be sincere in our search. And that number two, we rectify ourselves because if you are rectified, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will definitely provide you with a wife that is also rectified. And if you're not, then you're going to get the same kind of wife that you have. That you, uh, that's in your characteristic. So it's, that's actually one of the key principles in this entire equation. It's you. It's you yourself. It's not looking at other people and saying, why can't my wife be like A, B, and C? Why can't my husband be like A, B, and C? The key aspect is to rectify yourself. And if you rectify yourself, if you're looking for a spouse, Allah will put barakah in that search. And if you're already married, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put barakah in that relationship. So that's one aspect. Those individuals who are searching for the spouse. Then there's the opposite opposite extreme. Those individuals who are already connected with the spouse. Now for them, these advices don't apply. There's a whole separate series of advices that the Prophet ﷺ gave. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a tawfiq to be among those who are sincere in our search, 
to be among those who rectify ourselves so that Allah provides us with those the company of those who are better and may he give us the opportunity to be among those who are raised with our spouses on the day of judgment and in, in, in placed into jannah wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin